2022 has been yet another very worthy year for the planet in general and for Europe in particular. It was the warmest year on our records for many Western countries. But don't be fooled by little differences. Each country A has been the warmest or the second warmest year. Um, that's the method that is. The big picture is that at the global level, the eight warmest year has all occurred in the last 10 years. And now they are all characterized by the technology in excess of one degree with respect to the three industrial years. Most of us humans have a tendency not to trust predictions made by experts. On the other hand, we are quite a bit reacting when exposed to evidence of immediate danger. I think last summer we be hot and enduring heat rain in Europe after not just as a warning, but as a very great sign for many of us. Records were broken all over the continent, not just in summer, but also in the US and in the region. Carlo, huge, huge apologies. We can't hear you. Um, so maybe try without your headset. Yes, I'm the better. Should be better now. Good. Yes. Sorry for this. Much better. Thank uh, you. Where did you lose me? Close to the beginning. Okay. So should I start again? <laughs> um, yeah, I was sort of saying that it was the warmest uh, year on record for many uh, for many European countries, but the real important element is not whether one specific country, for one specific country was the warmest or not the, the warmest, but the second warmest year. The big picture is that at the global level, the eight warmest year have all occurred in the last eight years. And they were all characterized by anomalies in excess of one degrees with respect to pre-industrial. Most of us, I mean, as humans, have a tendency not to trust predictions made by experts. But on the other hand, we are quite good at reacting when exposed to evident and immediate danger. I think last summer with the hot and enduring heat waves in Europe acted not just as a warning, but very much as a worrying event for many of us. Records were broken all over the continent, not just in summer, but also in autumn and winter. And it wasn't just temperature, soil moisture, river flow, snow cover, glacier were all affected as well. More information about 2022 will become available later in the year when we'll publish the European State of the Climate Report. As a scientist working on climate, I would really love to make climate dull again, if I may. Don't take me wrong, I think uh, uh, I wouldn't do this job if uh, I found the climate not to be boring, mm -hmm. but climatologists used to get excited when confronted with a long lasting temperature record because in the absence of an underpinning trend, these events were rare. But breaking a temperature record when there is a clear underpinning trend is like playing with a loaded dice. The results on average are neither unexpected nor surprising. We cannot be sure now whether the next summer will be the warmest on record or just warmer than the last one. But if I were betting, I would definitely bet on a hot summer as chances will certainly be in my favor. The rare event are now, will be now really to see a really cold year. The annual statement, which has become a regular appointment for many of you, is based on the data that Copernicus program makes available openly and freely. This year is not exception. Understanding <clears throat> our changing climate is now so important that it's becoming an imperative to make climate data available and easy to use for interested parties or individuals. All you hear today is based on the data freely available on the Climate Data Store, and all the results you hear about can be reobtained and regenerated by anyone with sufficient time and interest. So um, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention, and I pass it back to you, Samantha. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Carlo. And I'm so sorry we had communication challenges there, but uh, you came across very clearly. I um, welcome to everyone who, who's joined since we began. I also neglected to mention the, the housekeeping information at the start of the presentation. Um, so if we could move to the housekeeping slide now, um, many of you will have noticed that we are recording uh, this meeting and uh, we do invite you to submit questions in the chat function and, and please articulate your, your name and, and media outlet to reflect the question. Um, this conference is also live streamed and, and recorded and is also available on YouTube. And we, uh, the presentations and all information available um, and presented during this conference will be made, av made available after this conference. I now have great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Freya Van Borg, a senior scientist at C3S and ECMWF to present the key findings from the climate highlights. Over to you, Freya. Thank you, Sam. And thank you to Mauro and Carlo for the words before. So indeed, I will present the findings of our Global Climate Highlights. This is a summary of our new findings for temperature and greenhouse gases, but also looks back at the monitoring we've done throughout the year in our monthly bulletins and in other monitoring activities that we undertake. So if we start with the global temperature, next slide, please. As uh, previously mentioned, Indeed, the last eight years have been the warmest globally. And if we look at 22 in particular, it was about 1.2 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial level, um, making it in our data set the fifth warmest. But as you can see from this graphic, you have 2022 at the right-hand side with the, um, our data set, but you can see the small dots on the other bars, which indicate the typical spread we have between, between various global data sets for temperature for every uh, single year. So that means that once the whole collection of data sets are there, um, they might show a different ranking because the four to eight years are very close together. Um, it's also worth mentioning, I think, that all of those eight warmest years have also been more than one degree warmer than the pre-industrial level. Next slide, please. So we'll move quite swiftly over to Europe. We all know that Europe has warmed significantly, as you can see from also this graphic on the right-hand side, starting in the 1980s, um, going towards the warmer periods um, later on, where blue indicates when the annual value was below average and where for, for that location, and where red indicates that it was above the 1991 to 2020 average. So as you can see, we're moving from below that average um, earlier in the, in the 80s to above it, um, mainly above it in later years. But as you can also see from this graphic, there is some, some variability from, from year to year, both in terms of the overall temperature for Europe, but also between the different regions. So if we look at 2022, it was the second warmest on record and above this 1991 to 2020 average for almost the whole continent bar Iceland. And if you <laughs> would be able to zoom in on the map, you would also see that central Turkey was below average. But I think what is really worth pointing out here is that even though we can't expect every year to be warmer than the next, the five warmest years on record for Europe were all within the last nine years. And this is not news, has been mentioned before that over these last four decades, Europe has warmed more than twice the global rate and faster than any other continent. But there should also be said that even though Europe has warmed faster during this time, this was not the case in the decades prior. And it also doesn't mean that other continents are not warming very fast as well. Next slide, please. So if we focus again on 2022, it was not only the second warmest year from Europe, but for many countries in Western Europe, it was either the warmest year on record or amongst the three warmest. And if we look on this particular graphic, 
um, which is the one you would have also found in an embargoed press release, you see the countries for which our data sets, data set indicates that 2022 was the warmest on record and for which it was the second. But as you can also see from the hashing, um, in this kind of borderline of countries between those being first or third to those having other rankings, that for most of those countries, the ranking to the next warmest year is within 0 0.1 degrees Celsius. And I think what really want to point out with this graphic is that while 2022 was only second warmest for Europe as a whole, well, only, um, there's really a large number of countries in the Western part of the continent that saw their warmest year on record. Next slide, please. When it comes to event, as Carl, events, as Carlo mentioned, um, probably the most striking things for, for Europe as a whole during 2022 was the heat wave and ensuing droughts during summer. And for the heat waves that they started relatively early, so already in May, there was a significant heat wave um, touching the southwest of Europe. And then throughout the summer months, there were several heat waves um, starting generally in Southwest Europe, and then depending on, on the heat wave, extending further, further north and east to also hit the more central and northern parts of Europe. This in combination with lack of rain, with clear skies sustaining these temperatures, and with dry soils that also can have a sustain, sustaining effect on temperature, led to significant droughts in many parts of, of Europe and especially in the south and the central parts during summer. And as a result, fire danger was also higher than, than usual in, especially in Southern Europe and leading to the highest summer wildfire emissions for at least the last 20 years for France, Spain, Germany and Slovenia. Next slide, please. Now we will zoom out of Europe again. So of course there are many regional extreme events across the globe and we're not trying to give a comprehensive record of all of them in this in these global climate highlights but focusing on those which have we have looked at in more detail throughout the year either through repeated reporting on specific events or on more in-depth um, reporting on some of them. So to mention just a few, was the very prolonged heat wave conditions that affected Pakistan and northern India in spring in the pre monsoon season with very, very high temperatures. Um, and also during the heat waves in central and eastern China during summer, where there was also significant droughts. <clears throat> then we have the very, very widespread flooding in Pakistan in August which was the result not only of rainfall during August itself, but during most of the, the summer months and um, leading up to the kind of really catastrophic flooding during August. If you now look at the map, you won't be able to see all of these reflected, of course, in a temperature anomaly that you can see there, where again, reds indicate that the year was warmer than average or warmer than the 1991 to 2020 average, and where it's blue, it was cooler. And in terms of being warmer, and we concentrate on the Northern Hemisphere, we see Europe, as already mentioned, also relatively large when we compare to the rest of the world, anomalies over part of the Russian and European Arctic. Um, but one should say that for the Arctic, those anomalies are not actually that large. There have been several years in the recent past where the annual anomalies have been larger there. If we now focus more on the, on the blue patches, of which there are not so many, there is still a significant large one in the in the Pacific tropical, well, in the tropical Pacific Ocean, um, especially in the eastern part of it, which is an indication of La Nina conditions. And indeed, 2022 saw the third year in a row of La Nina conditions. Um, La Nina has an effect on global temperatures. So you would expect global temperatures to be slightly cooler than if it had been a neutral year or an El Nino year. But La Nina also had, have other effects across the globe, 
more typical effects, and um, one of which is um, what we can also partly see here on the map is uh, more rainfall in eastern Australia and the resulting also cooler temperatures. And indeed, Australia experienced heavy rainfall, well, especially in the east, um, throughout almost every month of the year um, and with resulting flooding as well. So if we move to the very south of the, the map and then around the Antarctic Peninsula, you will see a relatively large red blob there. And this is partly related to very low sea ice conditions in the Weddell Sea, which is east of the peninsula, and the Bellinghausen Sea for the latter part of the year. So if we move to the next slide, please. And indeed, the Antarctic saw low sea ice conditions during most of 2022. So in the top graphic, you can see the daily evolution of 2020 sea ice extent for Antarctica or for around Antarctica. And, and in red, you see the evolution during 2022, where the sea ice extent reaches lowest minimum in the 44 year satellite record in February of last year. But not only was sea ice low in February at the time of the minimum, but six months throughout 2022 saw record or near record low monthly values. That said, um, we all know that sea ice is disappearing on a, on a global scale or has a downward trend. This trend is mainly driven by the Arctic, whereas Antarctica, as you can see from the bottom slide, there is much more variability from year to year. So even though 2022 is so very low sea ice conditions, and this has also happened a couple of years since 2015, there were also years prior to that with relatively large sea ice, sea ice extent. So the trend, there is no such uh, significant trend in for Antarctica. Next slide, please. And last, but definitely not least, we are together, CC3S, together with CAMS, uh, monitoring greenhouse gas uh, concentrations for the two um, gases, carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, the reason we're focusing on these two is because these are the ones which um, you can reliably derive using satellite measurements, meaning that what we see here is atmospheric concentration across the whole column of the atmosphere, um, rather than the just at the surface measurements that one may know from, for instance, Mauna Loa. And both gases increased and reached record heights during 2022. Carbon dioxide increased by about 2.1 parts per million. This is uh, relatively similar to the increases of previous years. And if we looked at methane, the increase was close to 12 parts per billion. This is relatively large, larger than kind of more recent, say average since 2010, um, but it's lower than the two record years we had in 2020 and 2021. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention. And we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Freya, for the very comprehensive presentation. So I'd now like to introduce the, the final member of our panel for the Q&A session this afternoon, who is Dr. Vince-Henri Pook, from, who's the director of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service at ECMWF. So if uh, Mauro, Freya and Vince Henri can all join on screen, we'll head over to the questions. And thank you so much for those who've already uh, started writing questions in the chat. So the first question comes from Kate Abnett from Reuters. And the question is, is it significant that Europe and the world saw such high overall temperatures in a La Nina year? Could you explain a bit about how La Nina conditions interact with the overall temperatures? Over to you, Freya. Yes. So, of course, it's significant um, because if we didn't have the underlying warming trend, then we wouldn't expect record years 
during La Nina year, La Nina year. Of course, it could potentially happen, but it would be unlikely. But because we have the underlying warming trend, the variations given by La Nina and by El Nino are superimposed on this. So we are, of course, more likely to get a very high temperature for the globe in an El Nino year, more likely than a La Nina. Um, I should also add that the kind of direct relationship is also not necessarily one-to-one -one because there's also potentially a lag between when exactly one of these events happen and when you see it reflected in the global temperatures. Thank you, Freya. The next question is from Annika uh, Degrius from the Swedish radio. Uh, and the question is, uh, what could be a reason for Europe warming faster than other continents or reasons, I guess? Over to you, Freya. Yeah, um, so, well, again, I'd like to iterate that even though Europe is warming faster, it's just warming a little bit faster than other continents. Um, there are a number of reasons for this, um, one is that part of Europe, and compared to the tropics, uh, Europe is in the higher, lat higher northern latitudes, which are warming faster. But then there are also quite a lot of kind of combined reasons, and I would say not all of them are clear. Which um, some of which are related to circulation. So, for instance, why summers have been so warm um, in the or in the Mediterranean has been shown to be due to circulation reasons. Um, and there are also other, so it's kind of a conglomerative of reasons. And I wouldn't say com a completely clear cut picture as of yet either. Thank you, Freya. The next question is from Audrey Garrick and is asking about the, the drought in Europe in 2022. Um, Audrey is from Le Monde, and she's asked if it is the worst drought ever recorded in Europe. So from a C3S point of view, we'd actually not quantify the droughts in terms of how large and how um, intense it was. I think this is something we will cover in European State of the Climate in more detail. So we're in monitoring in terms of drought factors soil moisture, precipitation, and temperature. And of course, during summer, these were um, very uh, low or much below average. And then there are other studies that show that previous droughts, and for instance, that one in 2018 was the, the worst drought on record until then, and that there were indications that the one in 2020 was worse still. But this is not something we've looked at in more detail, or there's not been a new study to confirm this. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Anne-Laure Fremont uh, from Le Figaro. And the question is, um, you say European temperatures have risen by more than double the global average over the past 30 years, and the rate of increase is the highest of any continent in the world. Can you explain why? Um, Freya, over to you, and, and perhaps Carlo as well, to compliment. Yes, yeah, so I think I will just compliment my answer from before, um, mainly with uh, why it's warming faster than the globe. And the large reason there is for all continents, we tend to just consider land surface values um, for these averages, whereas for the globe, we'll con consider all surfaces. And land has itself warmed faster than um, the, surf, the air above the oceans. Um, so that's a simple statistical reason for why you have, um, well, so one of the reasons is this simple statistical one. Um, Carlo, if you want to add more on the European side of things. Well, just, just maybe one, one element that is, is that it is true that over the last 30 years, Europe has warmed, has warmed faster than other regions, the I continent. But if you look at the previous 30 years, that wasn't the case. So there is always an element of, of a fluctuation that are maybe also statistical fluctuation that needs to be accounted for. Thank you. Uh, the next question is asking about the different reference periods. So it's a question from Christina Shavida. Uh, and it's asking about the the reference period, the pre-industrial reference period, 1850 to 1900, 
and the 1991 to 2020 reference period, which one is better to use in reporting and what does each one mean? Um, Freya, I think you're best place to describe this. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, in an ideal world, we would use 1850 to 1900 as a pre-industrial proxy for everything we report on, but the matter of the fact is that we, for most um, data, we don't have global coverage going back that far in time. So this is one reason why this is not possible. For temperature, it's possible for on the global scale. So when we look at global averages, um, because that we know that there is not such a big difference between the, the kind of level of coverage which we had for that time for temperature. And if you um, instead would compare um, with that level of coverage today, so you would get a similar rate of increase. Um, why we use 1991 to 2020, so specifically, uh, this is uh, one of the WMOs, so the World Meteorological Organization's uh, reference periods. So they're defined always as 30 year periods from the first year of a decade until the 30 years forward in time. And we use this one because it's a recommended to move to this one. So about two years ago, we moved from the 1981 to 2010. Um, we do actually in our monthly bulletin show both at the same time. Um, so one can ch choose either or when one, one reads our bulletins. And of course, the period 1991 to 2020 is somewhat warmer even than just that 1981 to 2010 one. But both of these periods are warmer significantly warmer than the pre-industrial, but these are periods for which, which we have a sufficient amount of data to actually properly define the reference period for a larger number of variables than just temperature and also for less well-observed regions of the world. Long answer, a bit technical, sorry about that. No, thank you, Freya. That was very clear. And it is really important to distinguish why we, we use different periods of time to quantify the amount of change. Um, the next question is from uh, Boba Wynn, and uh, it supplements the question from uh, anne Law Fremont. I would like to ask whether the reduction of aerosol pollution over Europe, I'm assuming during the COVID lockdowns in 2020, but the question doesn't say, played a role in amplified warming over the European continent. Uh, Vince Henri, over to you. You're muted. Sorry. Um, yes, maybe the question is not fully complete. So in terms We've just lost your connection, Vince Henri. You're frozen and we can't hear you. Okay, maybe we'll um, move to the next question um, whilst we wait for Vince Henri to reconnect. Um, the next question is from uh, Daria Chakalaskia, and apologies if I've mispronounced that, which I'm sure I have. Um, the question is, what's the current relationship between uh, the um, carbon dioxide parts per million in the atmosphere and the temperature increase? Um, uh, Carlo, would you like to take this one? Yes, sure. So I guess uh, th this is, uh, I guess, a question about the greenhouse effect, if you want. So we know that a significant part of the warming that we are observing is due to the uh, to the greenhouse effect. So there is a greenhouse effect that is natural and is simply due to the fact that we have an atmosphere and in the atmosphere there are uh, great, uh, greenhouse gases such as uh, CO2, water, and methane, and so on. But increasing the concentration of these green of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere actually enhance this greenhouse effect and so rise the temperature. It's not, uh, um, the relation is not something you can uh, easily write in, uh, in an equation. So it is not, uh, you cannot make a proportion between uh, concentration of greenhouse gases and, and rise in temperature. But there is generally a linearity in the amount of uh, accumulated emission and the rise in temperature. So increasing one, increase the others. So I guess that's the best uh, uh, answer I could give at this stage in time. 
uh, if you want more detail on this linearity between accumulated emissions and uh, rising temperature, um, the IPCC last assessment report is certainly the place to look at. Great, thank you so much, Carlo. And hopefully uh, Vince Henri is back with us and we can hear him to respond to the uh, question associated with aerosol pollution and amplified warming. Yes, so, sorry. So I, I, I was uh, saying that for the specific case of 2022 and the very high uh, summer in particular, I don't think there is a relationship. Now the question for the uh, 30 last years and uh, regional impact of uh, aerosol reduction thanks to uh, uh, combating air pollution uh, shielding uh, uh, part of the of, of the warming and with uh, and, and with uh, improved air quality uh, throughout Europe the possibility that this uh, shielded a bit less of the uh, of the of the global warming I think I, I think it's it's still um, uh, an, an open debate, uh, even if the all the figures uh, of aerosol as uh, mostly a minus and uh, greenhouse gases mostly as a plus in, in in the forcing to the to the atmosphere are well covered and, and well discussed with the uncertainty in the IPCC uh, in the IPCC report. Uh, such a regional effect uh, is is still a matter of uh, of, of, of of research. Thank you, Vince Henri. The next question is from Alice Hancock in the Financial Times. Uh, she's asked for a sense of what our expectations are for 2023, although she understands if it's hard to say, and what impact of increased burning of coal in light of the energy situation could have. Carlo, over to you. Yes, uh, is indeed, as I was alluding to in the introduction, is indeed a bit too early to make uh, firm predictions about the, the year, the next year. Still, what I was referring to is still valid, given that there is an underpinning trend. Uh, expecting or bidding for a, a warmer temperature is not really a difficult. Uh, 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 betting for a uh, warming uh, temperature is not really a difficult bet to make. Now, in the specific 2023, what we can look at are the seasonal predictions. At this stage in time, they seem to suggest that the El Nino, so the La Nina condition that is prevailing at the moment, uh, should should switch to neutral and could then get into an ending your condition, but it's too it's, as you said it's a bit too early to make such a prediction with any confidence because uh, uh, six months down the line is is a bit too far for, for us. It's a plausible scenario at this stage, but it's not something we can uh, assure will happen. We need to wait another month or two before getting a better grasp on on the evolution of that. In terms of, of the emission, uh, the, the coal emission, I guess we can refer back to the previous question about the relationship between greenhouse gases and temperature. We know that the greenhouse effect is playing, is playing a very important role in controlling the rising temperature that we are observing. And so uh, not uh, uh, reducing the emission, not, not getting rapidly to the net zero can only uh, continue, can only enhance the existing trend in temperature temperatures. Thank you, Carlo. And just to complement that, um, coal, of course, is much worse than gas for air pollution. So any increases that we see in using coal as an energy source over this winter will have uh, significant consequences for air pollution. The next question is from Sophie de Villiers. And it's uh, similar to a previous question asking why Europe is warming faster uh, than other continents. And if we look at the data over the last 30 years, are there particular scientific reasons such as atmospheric circulation that can be articulated? Freya, over to you. Yeah, so as said in the previous answer, this is kind of a still debated issue, why this is or why, you know, what are kind of the main individual drivers between kind of additional warming over Europe? And as said before, uh, one reason is um, Europe's position in the world, close to the high northern latitudes. As we all know that the Arctic as a region is the fastest warming region of the world. Um, and then also the one example I mentioned before is a study that came out in summer talking about uh, summer temperatures in the Mediterranean and changes in the atmospheric circulation um, that has you know, facilitated 
them, so to say. But that's, of course, only part of the story. It's only part of the year and it's uh, only one part of Europe. And I would say the answer probably is slightly different for different regions of Europe. And it's kind of the combination that, that makes this statistic. Thank you, Freya. The next question is from Enza Tedesco from Montel News. And uh, the question is, we're seeing very mild temperatures and rainier conditions in the European winter so far. Do you expect any cold snaps and more dryness in the continent before the end of the winter season? Or will mild weather remain for the rest of the season? Uh, Carlo, I think your best place to answer this. Well, looking back at uh, what we said uh, at the beginning of this winter, we were expecting a milder winter with chances of cold outbreak, as we have seen at the beginning of December. Then after this cold outbreak that has affected uh, Central and Northern Europe, there was actually a very warm event. Now, what will happen late in the, in the winter, in this still mild, uh, generally mild winter, is um, difficult to, to say with, with certainty and to some extent depend on what uh, might happen in the stratosphere. So um, the, a disruption in the polar vortex around the uh, Arctic stratosphere may induce cold outbreak in Europe in February. So to answer your question directly, yes, um, a possibility of a cold outbreak is still uh, very much a possibility. At this stage, it's too early to say whether this will happen or not, but is is um, clearly a, a possibility for February onwards. Thank you, Carlo. Um, and the next question is uh, on a, a, a similar topic from Rudy Bressa, uh, Le Science, uh, Italian edition of Scientific American. And it's talked about the warming trend in 2022 and the astonishing temperatures recorded in, in winter and early in, I guess, early in 2023. And could this reflect the future for European winters? Um, Carlo, you've answered this in part already, but if you could go into more detail. And Freya, we, we have an additional graphic on this. I'm not sure if it's worth sharing this at this point in time. Yes, I, I guess this um, has been uh, mostly, mostly answered already, but it, 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 in a sense for... Um, um, yeah, so there are two elements really to stress for me. One is the fact that when you go to uh, sub-seasonal uh, monthly or even weekly climate, then you, you should expect a lot of variation as we have seen in this variation. We have seen this variation in, in uh, late November, in December, uh, at the beginning and the end of, of December, there were very different anomalies. And now we're still in, in, a, uh, in a very split situation with a half of the continent extremely warm and the other half with really very cold temperature. What will happen next, uh, as I mentioned, uh, with largely depend on uh, in Europe will largely depend on, on what's happening in the stratosphere. If you look at the other world, then uh, I guess the, the place to look at the Central Pacific and especially what's going to happen with the evolution of the Nina. Great, thank you. And um, if, if we can show the additional graphic in the extra material, I think this may be helpful to, to remind everyone of the, the anomalies that we saw at the around the New Year's period between 2022 and 2023. Freya, do you have the specific slide number for the technical support team? Yes, yeah, so it's 16. Thank you. Perhaps while that's coming up, there's a, a further question from Sophie de Villiers, uh, who asks concretely, what can we expect from El Nino in Europe? And concretely, what does uh, this mean for, for temperatures rising in Europe? Or will it only be global temperatures that rise? And Sophie de Villiers is from La Libre in Belgium. Uh, but back to you, Freya, whilst uh, other people reflect on this question. Um, back to me. I think the, the idea was to keep slide 16 up at the same time. Um, yeah, so I think what we just wanted to highlight here is what Carlo said already, that even though we had very warm temperatures at the end of December, which is what you can see at the right hand side, um, just with slightly different averaging periods, so longer at the top and more centered over the new year at the bottom and um, at the start of December, you see on the right hand side, indeed, those very large warm anomalies um, associated with that very intense, but also very short 
uh, warm spell. Um, whereas indeed at the beginning of the month, large parts of um, Western, Northwestern, well, Northwestern Europe um, saw much below average temperatures. And this kind of go back, goes back to what um, Carlo said before, that there's also relatively high variability during winter um, driven by dynamical conditions. So um, this means that it's, um, it can kind of give some tendencies uh, for winter, but there is uh, large variability in between. Um, but of course, winters, like all other seasons in Europe, are warming. So we will expect to see warmer winters as we go forward. And also, it's kind of uh, what many winter maybe call a warm spell because temperatures don't get so high uh, compared to summer temperatures. But these kind of maximum temperatures will also continue increasing during uh, the colder part of the year. Great, thank you very much. Um, and is there anything further to um, add on the question of El Nino and the, the implications, not only globally, but for Europe, if we, we do enter a El Nino phase, which as Carlo described, it's a little bit early for us to say with confidence just yet. Either you, Freya or Carlo, I think. No, Carlo. Well, I, I I think is um, you know uh, there are other parts of the world that has a, have a stronger teleconnection with the Nino than Europe has, so the influence uh, over Europe is not as direct as it is, for instance, as Freya has shown over Australia or South America. Um, it, it is particularly true in summer. So for, for the summer, I think the, the the main impact would probably be through the global mean. So we do expect generally uh, if if the El Nino materialized, then we expect generally higher temperature, which may have an impact on, on the European condition. Great, thank you. And I think it's also fair to say that the, as Carlo described, the teleconnections and implications for temperatures in Europe, that although there are relationships, it's very hard to unpack these relationships with a, a, a place as dynamic as the global atmosphere. And, and these uh, implications are also very seasonally dependent as well. So, so there is some scientific e evidence that there are stronger impacts of El Nino. I think it's during European summers than, than other parts of the year, but um, the, it, it's always very challenging to unpack the, the uh, component parts to teleconnections. Uh, the, there's a further clarification from uh, Bob Berwin, and uh, I mispronounced your name previously, Inside Climate News, uh, talking about the 30 year trend of amplified warming over Europe re relative to other continents and how aerosols have impacted this. So Vince Henry, I'm not sure if you have anything further to add um, from your pre previous response to this question. Yeah, not, not, not much. Just to say that uh, aerosol, of course, have not only a, a human uh, element, there is a, a very big, a very big natural uh, element of, uh, of aerosol, uh, principally uh, uh, dust uh, sources, uh, wildfires also. So, it's, so it's the, the, the question is, is a bit more complex than, uh, than, that, that, than that. So it's clear that the uh, several emissions of, uh, of aerosol are modified also by, uh, by, by climate change, by hotter and drier temperatures. So thinking specifically of, uh, of wildfires. So this bundles in with the reduction in anthropogenic emissions of uh, aerosol to, uh, thanks to air quality uh, legislation. So, so it's hard to, to have a black and white response and, and, and to, uh, to flag uh, aerosol and improvement in, uh, in air quality and reduction in uh, air quality emissions as a key source in, the, uh, uh, in, in what we see about Europe in the, in the last 30 years. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Wolfgang uh, Pomerain from the German internet magazine Telepolis. Uh, and the question is, how usual or unusual is the path of the recent low pressure areas moving over Scandinavia for this time of year? Um, I personally don't have an answer to that. I'm not sure if anyone else on the panel has a, a clear understanding of that. I think it's fair to say we've not done any analysis of this event yet. Um, uh, if we did, um, it, it may be available later on. 
Uh, but I think it's fair to say that what we're finding uh, is that uh, it is very important to look at historical storms to understand the different pathways that storms can take and different low pressure systems can take. And this is why C3S and many other organizations invest in data rescue so that we have this historical perspective of, of, storm, uh, of historical storm tracks. And this helps us in understanding um, previous behavior of storms and, and therefore understanding resilience for infrastructure. As Mara said at the beginning, you know, improving our understanding of climate of the past really helps ensure we can have a, a climate resilient future. The next question is from Christina Danila and has asked about the sea surface temperature trend. Uh, Freya, over to you for that. Uh, sea surface temperature trend, where? <laughs> she, she has a mention. So I, I guess if, if we go to the global map, the, the two key areas that were particularly strong in terms of additional warming were certainly the Mediterranean and the, the area around New Zealand was also anomalously warm. So yeah, so I, we, if we look on our map, though, these are surface air temperatures, so not necessarily fully representative of SSTs. So, of course, sea surface temperatures are also warming globally. Um, some parts of the world warming more rapidly than others. Um, and when it comes to summer, indeed, the Western Mediterranean was very warm. There were recorded marine heat waves there, but is not something C3S has looked into in more detail beyond what was reported also by others. But I think this is also something we will cover in the European State of the Climate uh, for coming out in April. Yeah, there's a follow up question on um, specifically on Western Mediterranean SSTs in 2022, uh, particularly compared with previous years, and the duration and intensity of the marine heat waves in that region. And uh, Freya, as you've described, um, we have focused on surface air temperatures for the climate highlights, but we will cover sea surface temperatures in more detail in the European State of the Climate Report, which will be launched in April this year. Um, the, the last question that I have in the chat right now is from Giannis uh, Moratidis, who asks, if we use the most old data we have, what will be the year that we can reproduce a color graphic like the previous ones for Europe? not quite sure how to unpack that question. So I throw it completely open to the panel. And, and I guess if, if we go back to um, the uh, small multiple map of Europe, we can see uh, that if we look at the historical information for Europe as a region, um, the, there are years that show uh, similar patterns but the um, the general trend through time is a, a warming Europe a, as indeed a warming globe. So if this a figure was, and I was hoping it would come up to help describe, um, so if the technical team could support on that, that would be amazing. Um, but I think the reality is that when we look at trends through time, we are continuing to see the planet warm. So, so recreating uh, a map that shows the same color scale of uh, 2022 with historical data is virtually impossible. Uh, Carlo, it looks like you want to interject with more information. No, I was wondering because I, I'm not sure I, I got the question either, um, but maybe it was about the sparsity of data. So the fact that, you know, if you look at all data, you, you may have fewer points. And I guess this is one of the, um, of the advantages of using the Copernicus data sets. So these are, uh, um, data set that some refer to or Freya referred to as a maps without gaps um, is really uh, an advantage in, in the sense that you can use the same resolution of data, although the quality is varying over time, and you can reproduce the same kind of maps for previous periods. So I don't know whether this was the angle the question was uh, alluding to, but it's an important element in the data set we have. And I, I think to complement Carlo's answer and Yanis, please add more information in the chat if we haven't answered your question. But we, uh, the so any data that C3S 
uh, producers and analyzers. We we also compare it with other global data sets, and we also compare it compare it with in situ weather observations that are held by national meteorological agencies. So of course, our data set goes back directly to um, uh, 1950, but this is complemented by uh, older uh, in situ observations that go back to 1850. 1850 globally, but then there are individual data sets that, ha that are held by nations that go back three or 400 years. So yes, the, the data gets more patchy as we go back through time, but regardless of the data set and the length of the data set, the trend is overwhelmingly very clear that the, the climate is getting warmer. Uh, if there's no further questions uh, coming up in the chat, um, then I would like to thank our speakers enormously. So Mara Fakini, uh, Carlo Bontempo, Vince Henri Pouk, and of course, Freya Vanberg. And thank everyone who's participated in the press conference today for your attention. Thank you very much. Please follow up with our um, press uh, Copernicus email address in case you have any follow up questions or would like an interview or would like access to the material that uh, has been shared with you virtually today. Thank you all and goodbye.